So I'm going to start by saying welcome to all of our uh, folks who are attending this third webinar sponsored by the Robinson Jeffers Association and the uh, Torhouse Foundation. And I'd like to thank you all who I cannot see, but know you're there uh, for making the time to uh, be with us this evening for a conversation about three uh, Jeffers poems that invoke issues of history and politics at a time when for better and for worse, those are on our mind. Um, so I wanna thank you all for coming. Um, just a couple of little protocols. Well, first, a couple of thank yous. One is to uh, Jim, Jim Carmen and Elliot Rukowitz Roberts, the presidents of our two associations uh, for sponsoring our, our programs. Uh, another is to you in the audience for just a being here. Um, there's another person who you do not see who is behind the scenes managing the uh, electronic levers uh, and who will be facilitating the dialogue a little later. And that's uh, Jessica Hunt, who is our, our producer. And uh, my name is Tim Hunt and I'm your moderator. Uh, the three people that you see with me on the screen are Shelley Alden Brooks from uh, University of California, Davis, whose recent book is Big Sur, The Making of a Prized California Landscape from UC Press. Uh, Whitney Hoth, a longtime uh, stu a student of, of Jeffers, who is an editor of, the Jeff of Jeffers Studies, uh, has written widely on Jeffers, and uh, a, once upon a time, a student of Radcliffe Squires, uh, a name we should all uh, remember uh, and celebrate more than I think we sometimes do. That is those of us in Jeffrey studies. And Robert Zoller, who I don't need to say too much about because he is in effect the Dean of, of Jeffrey studies and uh, you all know Robert's work. And if you don't get busy, uh, you, you saw the titles in the promotional material uh, and uh, seek it out. Um, that's sufficient for an introduction. Format for tonight will be fairly simple. Each of the three panelists will make a brief opening remark um, up to about five minutes or so where they will introduce a, a, a point or a aspect of the, of the poem or poems that they've chosen uh, or a question. Uh, then we'll uh, jump into a conversation among the three of them uh, following from that. And from there, the conversation will open up to respond to, as well, uh, questions and comments that you would like to pose. And this is where I need to really quickly orient you to our Zoom protocol. Uh, the panelists do not see you. You are not on camera. Your mics are not live. They do not hear you. If you would like to make a comment or pose a question, use the Q&A box on Zoom or use the, uh, uh, the Facebook comment feature. And Jessica will be passing those questions and comments along to me and I will work them into the conversation, uh, as many of them as I can, as uh, dexterously as, as I can. Um, we have an hour um, and at, an, at the end of an hour, we go dark. Uh, so, um, the, the, the theory is we want a lively conversation, but we want to leave you wanting more so you'll come back for the next webinar. We don't want to drag this uh, out too long. Our three poems for tonight are Shine, Perishing Republic, Shine, Republic, and Shine, Empire. Uh, the first of these was written in uh, no later than 1923 as Jeffers was still coming to terms with the impact of World War I uh, and the emergence of the 1920s. The second was written in the middle of the Great Depression. And the third was written on the advent of World War II as Jeffers had already pretty much concluded that the United States would be drawn into the war because of uh, Roosevelt's attempt to provide uh, support to, to Great Britain. So these are poems that uh, are in a sense, historically uh, situated, even as, as with all of Jeffers' work, they attempt to speak beyond their time. I'm going to start things off tonight by reading just the first poem, Shine, Perishing Republic, because you all have the, uh, all three of them to refer to, and then we'll move directly into uh, the conversation with our panelists uh, tonight, and Shelley will be leading off. Uh, 
so shine, perishing republic. While this America settles in the mold of its vulgarity, heavily thickening to empire and protest, only a bubble in the molten mass pops and sighs out and the mass hardens. I, sadly smiling, remember that the flower fades to make fruit, the fruit rots to make earth. Out of the mother and through the spring exultances, ripeness and decadence and home to the mother. You making haste, haste on decay, not blameworthy. Life is good, be it stubbornly long or suddenly a mortal splendor. Meteors are not needed less than mountains shine, perishing republic. But for my children, I would have them keep their distance from the thickening center. Corruption never has been compulsory. When the cities lie at the monster's feet, there are left the mountains. And boys be in nothing so moderate as in love of man, a clever servant, insufferable master. There is the trap that catches noblest spirits that caught, they say, God, when he walked on earth. So Shelley, will you lead off for us? Yes. And Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, everyone. I'm looking forward to the conversation. And I'll, I'll start by sharing some thoughts that I had as I read these three poems. Um, I did so through the lens of US history, for I'm a historian, and in particular through the lens of environmental history. Um, that's my particular focus. And as I read, I saw the hallmarks of Jeffers' verse that became familiar to me while researching Big Sur. In these three poems we consider tonight, like in some of his about the coast, Jeffers stands as a sharp critic of his contemporary society. He laments the passing of what he sees as an earlier period of greater freedom, greater purity, a time when nature commanded more power and people less, and therefore a time of greater balance between humans and the earth, when the corrupting influences of civilization were fewer. And this is, this is how I'm seeing it, how I'm reading it. And uh, I see his distaste, distaste for Europe, which of course being emblematic of Western civilization is quite common among many Americans after World War I. And as Jeffers saw Europe and ultimately America drifting toward a second world war, he seemed to have become resigned to his country's rising power, which he interpreted as its degeneration, its loss of freedom. And while reading Shine Republic, I was reminded of another poem written a year later in 1935 that employs a similar rhetoric of freedom, but from a very different perspective. And this poem is Let America Be America Again by Langston Hughes. And Jessica, if you could please share, thank you, um, that so that you all, I'll, I'll just be quiet just for a brief moment while you skim that and I'll talk a bit about it. So Langston Hughes, like Jeffers, understood the promise that the United States had long held out to its people and its image in the world. And Hughes too equated freedom with the opportunity that comes from access to land and open space. And like Jeffers, Hughes deplored the exploitative practices that harm the land and the laborers at the hands of powerful men. And as you can see, Hughes had faith in the promise of the United States and never though did he allow his reader to forget that his country had not been a land of freedom for many Americans. To Hughes, the United States did not need to return to an earlier time of freedom in nature, but to make freedom something attainable for all, regardless of race. In another part of the poem that is not included here, Hughes says America is, quote, the land that never has been yet, but must be the land where every man is free. And like Jeffers, Hughes saw redemptive power in the land, 
but for him, a proper relationship with the natural world would be a means to establish freedom for its people, not regain the tradition of Western freedom that Jeffers identified with Aeschylus and Washington. And this is all the more striking to me as Hughes was part of the Harlem Renaissance, of course, of the interwar period. And he joined there African-Americans who were part of the great migration, many leaving the farms of the South in search of greater opportunity and freedom in the urban North, Midwest and West. And writing from New York, Hughes saw the land as holding the power to redeem the nation and put it on course toward a freedom that would no longer be an empty promise for Americans of color. When I consider Shine Republic and Let America Be American, I, again, alongside one another, as an environmental historian, I'm struck by the role that nature plays in both of these poets' works. And yet I also see two different trajectories in them. Jeffers looks backward toward freedom, lamenting what was lost as America took on the shape of empire. Hughes looks ahead, aiming to inspire hope and action. And because we're having this conversation today, I cannot help but think about the current significance of these perspectives. Even Hughes's final line, and make America again, invites this reflection. For it's close to a familiar political slogan, a slogan that invokes not forward movement, but a return to perceive better days for our nation. So I'll close by considering just how durable these two poets' arguments are, despite the nearly 90 years of history that has intervened. These two ideas still help define political discourse and debate. Is America's greatness something that once was and can it be reclaimed? Or are we still in the project of working toward that greatness, a project which demands calling out the ways in which freedom has been denied to certain Americans? And finally, to bring it back to the land, one last relevant question for our times, as far as I'm concerned, is how can our relationship to the environment help secure this freedom? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Whitney? Uh, well, when Tim proposed these poems for discussion, I thought I would focus on them as a set, but that was far too ambitious. So I'll concentrate instead only on Shine Republic 1934. It seems to me the clearest statement of Jefferson's political views. I would characterize Jefferson as he appears in Shine Republic as a classical small R Republican in a tradition reaching back to Thomas Jefferson and from Jefferson as far back as Plato's Republic. Republicanism of this kind is not fundamentally democratic. It accommodates democracy, but limits it. Its ambition is to secure not collective social welfare, but individual liberty, which often involves, and certainly does involve in its Jeffersonian form, a commitment to protecting private property and to governments narrowly restricted to maintaining limited individual rights under law. Thoreau was another small R Republican of this kind, believing that government is best, that governs least. The focus for these libertarian Republicans is not equality or welfare or the will of the people, but independence and liberty, to use Jefferson's word, freedom. Jefferson's phrase in Shine Republic that freedom often requires blood for its fuel recalls Jefferson's famous declaration that the tree of liberty is repressed with the blood of patriots and tyrants. Similarly, Jefferson's insistence that we cannot have all the luxuries and freedom also, echoes many similar statements by Jefferson who considered urbanization and manufacturing as corruptions of Republican virtue. But Jefferson's denunciation of luxury reaches even further back to Hellenic characterizations of the Greco-Persian wars as a struggle of simple living small city states, notably Sparta, against the oppressive imperial opulence opulence of Persepolis and Sardis. Jefferson's invocation of the battles of Marathon and Concord is meant to reinforce this concept of freedom as necessarily contemptuous of luxury, since luxury is understood as a threat to independence. In contrast, labor and relative poverty are celebrated as ideal conditions of liberty. In this respect, Jefferson's aligned with Plato, Rousseau, and Locke, as well as Jefferson 
all of whom believed liberty was best realized in small agrarian communities of independent landowners living in modest self-sufficiency, far away from urban concentrations of landless dependent laborers. Let me say in passing that I see a clear reference to Walt Whitman in Jefferson's apostrophe to America in the fourth stanza of Shine Republic. Jefferson says, America did not say en masse, but independence. It is Walt Whitman who famously said en masse in the opening inscription to Leaves of Grass. Whitman is notably and to a remarkable degree, the celebrant of the urban proletariat, the milling crowds of Manhattan, mechanics and manufacturers. And Whitman is also the poet of mass democracy and industrial might. He later had his misgivings, but he remains for us a celebrant of the people and of their collective will and energies. Jeffers, in contrast, a contrast I believe he meant to emphasize expressly against Whitman, does not celebrate masses, but individuals, not cities and material abundance, but as he once said, rock narrowed farms. This is the tradition to which Shine Republic belongs, but a telling and distinctive note in this poem so characteristic of Jefferson's work is a resigned recognition that the material conditions for preserving such liberty no longer exist. And the great tradition, at least in America, must end. In this we see Spang uh, Jefferson's Spanglerian pessimism, his belief in supra-political, supra-historical determinants, which gives most of his political poems their elegiac tone, a tone Peter Quigley has aptly described as resigned anguish. As many of you may be aware, some right-wing extremists, such as the British nationalist, nationalist Jonathan Bowden, among others, have claimed to derive inspiration and support from Jeffers. You can hear them ranting on the internet this evening, if you care to. But they are not, I suggest, reading Jeffers very well, just as they seldom read Spengler well. Jeffers was not, any more than Spengler, a political fantasist. He was rather, as was Spengler, a fatalist. Jefferson's cultural despair does not authorize political action, but detachment, not resistance, but avoidance. His inhumanism abandons hope in mass social action and counsels instead retreat to an Epicurean garden, garden quiet evening walks, separation, silence. Jeffers had no use for the state in his view, war makes the state and the state makes war. Or as he put it yet more bluntly in a later poem, all governments are thugs and liars. We may wish to fault Jeffers for his political quietism, but it is important to correctly identify it. As to what counsel or wisdom Jeffers might have for us in our current political crises, I'd be interested to hear about that from other participants in our webinar this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Robert. Thank you. Um, and thank um, you, Whitney, and uh, you, Shelley. Shelley, you mentioned, of course, and showed Langston Hughes. And uh, it's not well known that uh, Hughes was a good friend of Jeffers. Um, and although their politics were far apart, they, they got along extremely well. There's a beautiful uh, photograph of the two of them together. And it's obvious they really enjoyed each other's company. And um, Whitman is also a point well taken. Um, Jeffers was asked about uh, the influence of Whitman on him and he said, no, um, there really wasn't one. Although, I mean, I think reading the line, the rhythm of the poetry, you can see uh, some influence, but uh, certainly they were very, very different uh, people and came came at the world from very different perspectives. And I, I agree, Whitney, with what you say that uh, Jeffers and Whitman are really at opposite poles. Well, here's a trilogy, the Shine Trilogy. And um, Jeffers couldn't have had it in mind when he wrote Shine Perishing Republic, 1923. The second poem didn't come till 34, the last 41. By the time he wrote Shine Empire, of course, he was well aware of the two poems that preceded them and he he saw them as a, as a kind of a unit. Um, to me, one of the interesting things about Shine Perishing Republic is that it comes five years after the end, around five years after the end of World War I. And 
Jeffers um, was very anxious as a not so young man of 31 to enlist in World War I, uh, even though he saw it as already in the Alpine Christ as a, as a great historic tragedy. But there was something about him that, uh, that responded to, for want of a better word, the adventure of it. Um, and he went to considerable lengths to join the service, even though he was exempted on grounds of high blood pressure and also the care of two infant children. It wasn't, I think, that he had a, um, a political agenda, well, we have to preserve democracy or, or what have you. Um, but there was something, and, and nobody's quite gotten at the bottom of it yet, something that impelled him to do this. And yet five years later, He's talking about America as a country that has already passed its zenith. And for a reason that's unexplained in the poem, except in terms of, well, everything has its cycle. And this is a natural cycle, like the cycles of nature, that um, America is now, um, has, has passed its pinnacle. Uh, has, is headed toward empire and um, that it's a, an irreversible course that it's embarked on. He never really explains this. There are, you know, one can look for explanations. He was a, had become a Californian. Uh, the idea of the end of the American frontier made famous by Frederick Jackson Turner the sense that, well, we've settled California and now where do we go from here? Um, that, that was part of uh, his time. And uh, Spengler, who hadn't yet appeared, um, I think, in, uh, in English uh, at that point, wasn't very popular, but there were others of, who were concerned about cycles of history. And of course, Jefferson had a great uh, interest in the cycles of the cosmos. Cyclical thinking was a, was a great part of uh, of what he was about. Um, but it, it remains fascinating in this poem that uh, he really thinks that in a certain sense, it's up with us. We have to play out our hand. Um, but um, the only thing we can try to do as private individuals is preserve as much of what America was or should have been about as possible. Then 11 years go by and shine republic. Uh, no longer a perishing republic. Well, maybe a republic that has perished in a certain sense already. But Jeffers is looking in this poem, I think retrospectively, trying to situate America within the Western civilization um, and to define what he takes, obviously in this poem, to be its most essential attribute, freedom. Um, and that this defines the Western world, Western civilization as such. And there have been previous exemplars of it, Aeschylus, Luther, Washington, one man. Um, but uh, we are in some sense, the end of the line. It doesn't say what'll come after us, something will. He thinks freedom will be reborn in this poem. Uh, and he thinks we should play out our hand, carve our, uh, our heel marks deep, as he says, and, um, and fulfill our destiny, unpleasant and difficult uh, as it may be. And then, of course, in 1941, this poem is a little before Pearl Harbor. So the war hasn't begun yet. Um, Jeffers realizes we're being drawn into another war, that it's inevitable, that there was no way to have avoided it, bitter as that is, and damnable as the politicians may be who drew us into it. Of course, he's not quite saying that yet. He hasn't gone on his Roosevelt kick. He says uh, Roosevelt's intentions were good. I think we must take that with a considerable grain of irony. And Hitler is a patriot. Uh, which I would suggest should also be taken ironically, but his, his sense here is really despairing that we have betrayed uh, our historic mission, if you will, in some essential sense. Uh, and yeah, we're left to play the hand out and the plant, the, the hand we're, we've dealt ourselves now is the worst possible. 
that we ourselves have become not just an empire, but the world empire that like Assyria, Babylon, um, aims at, at a kind of world rule that is impossible and, and undesirable in the profoundest sense. Okay. Well, we have three, three perspectives on the table. Uh, do you have questions or comments for each other as we go forward, as we start on this uh, journey? Whitney, we lost your mic there. That's only happened by five or 600 times to me this year or so. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I appreciated Shelley's observation about the, um, the backward looking quality of uh, Jefferson's position in Cheyenne Republic as against uh, uh, Langston Hughes' potential future hope. And um, it, is a, it is a concern of mine relative to Jefferson's politics to the extent that they can be, and in fact have been, um, used uh, to provide comfort and support to reactionary positions. Um, and as I indicated, there are persons who believe that, that they do. Um, I was at pains to say that they don't, um, not because they're affirmative about the future, because they aren't, but because their position is truly radical, which is that the, the idea of a, of a Spenglerian cyclical decline means that, that resistance and, and, and attempts to restore a disappeared order are not practical. They're not achievable. They're not rigorous. For Jeffers, it is, it is a, a mark of the, the hopelessness of, a, of the late stage of decay that he believes of American democracy represents. And that has to be accepted with resignation, not with fantasies of reviving some some utterly disappeared material condition of agrarian, you know, sufficient uh, independent farmers it does not exist and it's not restorable. And Jeffers was not a fantasist in that respect. He, he understood the changed material conditions and what that meant. Well, there's a distinction here in Jeffers between um, the, the Republican and the small D Democrat. Um, yes, I, Whitney, I think you're right uh, that in your description of what Jeffers' view of the sort of ideal constitution of things would be if it were possible. But he also says in uh, The Poet and a Democracy, his uh, Library yeah. of Congress lecture of 1941, which is contemporary with uh, with Shine Empire, that uh, yes, he's a Democrat and that, uh, democracy is the best um, political system and one of the reasons why it's best is because there's no snobbery in it. Mm -hmm. but the, the fundamental element of, of a democracy um, is that men consider themselves as equals and judge each other by who they are and what they do rather than any ascribed status they may have. And he thinks that is really essential to any kind of uh, a decent political order. Um, I don't think anybody can can capture him for, for a particular political position without really doing injustice to uh, to the stance he takes in his work. And you know, a lot of people on the left, I'm sure Langston Hughes among them, uh, were trying in the 1930s, especially to uh, capture him from a for a left point of view. But he's not a guy who really settles into anything. You can well, make a neat formula. You could argue that he, he failed his generation's uh, political litmus test, which was the question of the Spanish Civil War. He not only failed it, he actually refused to take it, which <laughs> makes him unique. Uh, he would not take a position on a Spanish Civil War, just except to say that he wouldn't lift a hand to help either side win, but that, of course, he would place his hand in the fire to prevent the suffering and the, and the death that would result. So he, he did take as what is always with Jeffers an extraordinarily radical position of, of beyond, beyond the terms of the, of the debate, even in his time and in ours. Yeah, um, well, what side might he have taken if he had decided to take one? A little difficult <laughs> to say because he had good things to say about both sides in terms of values, however distorted that they, they represented for people. But uh, his, his opposition to getting involved in World War II did not preclude 
um, his, his saying that uh, England was fighting what he called a great fight. Um, he didn't say what the fight was about, didn't say who it was with, although that was quite obvious at the time. He wrote in the context of, of the months leading up to the Battle of Britain. Um, and he said that uh, he was a Democrat and that he would fight fascism if it ever came to America. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the point he was trying to make, I think, was that it hadn't come. And um, there was no point in trying to fight it somewhere else for some other reasons. Well, it hadn't come. I guess we could question whether it has. Shelley, you're about to jump in there. Oh, no, I'm, I'm well, I'm fascinated listening to this back and forth, and I appreciate the, the added perspective. I've, I've, it's been a conundrum for me to try to understand where Jeffers st uh, stood on, on these issues, reading about his understanding that it seems war is a natural state. Um, I know that there's a, a time where he references that he um, doesn't you know, uh, imagine that people will stop fighting, and yet the freedom that he wants um, in this case, is it the, the freedom, as you all were talking, I was thinking about the agrarianism and I appreciate what you're saying, Whitney, that he never saw the, um, he didn't imagine we could go backward uh, to that, that sort of agrarianism. So what, what was the freedom that he imagined? Would, what would have felt right to him? What would have felt like freedom in that time period in the, in the 30s if, the, if people had been rejecting luxuries, if people had been um, uh, treating the earth with greater respect, um, treating each other with greater respect? What, what, or was he just resigned to see decline? Uh, and as it, as a, as a stance at that point, um, not liking the direction that his country was going. I think he was a fatalist at that point in terms of the politics of his own time. And he was a fatalist generally. Um, his notion of freedom had something to do with economic independence, uh, with an agrarian society. And as I, I've said, with, with an absence, a rejection of snobbery. And um, these for him were in a sense, timeless values. They couldn't always be realized in every epoch or every society. Um, they couldn't abide forever. He didn't think anything would last forever. Our founding fathers certainly didn't think our government would last forever. Most of them gave it 100, 150 years. So we probably outlived our shelf life at this point. It seems that way if you read the paper every day. Uh, Jeffers tried to find a position that, for, for want of a better way to put it, would resist taking sides, specific sides. He tried to find the, the deeper meaning and the deeper sense of history that, um, that every epic disclosed little by little. Um, so he, for example, uh, he was horrified by the Second World War, few people expressed uh, a greater horror of it. Um, he was appalled by everything that, uh, that was involved in it. But at the same time, he writes in The Bloody Sire that war is a, a great source of, um, for want of a better word, value. That it, uh, it gives to life things that um, otherwise it would not have. Um, and that uh, to denounce war, simply from a pacifist point of view, which was never his point of view, would be to mistake it as a natural human phenomenon. And that what you had to try to do above everything else was to understand as, as widely, as broadly as you possibly could, what was going on and what things meant and where they stood in, in a wider picture. We have, we have a, one of the questions we have here is whether, um, we are trying to make any make. I'm, I'm not doing. The, I'm not getting the question quite right. I'm, I'm redirecting it just a little bit for the what we're, what we're in the middle of. That we're making excuses for Jeffers, and is that really allowable uh, in terms of what we saw uh, a few weeks ago? Um, in other words, does does Jeffers' perspective allow for um, the assault on the Capitol? I think we'll assume Jeffers would not have been involved in the assault on the Capitol. 
um, is that the blood uh, of, of liberty? And it is a difficult issue. Um, one of the things to remember is that he did write a poem uh, called Tragedy Has Obligations in which he talks specifically about Hitler and he chose never to publish it. Everson puts it in the double acts as if it was suppressed in his edition of the double acts, but it was never actually offered for publication. And it's now widely disseminated on white supremacist neo-Nazi websites as a vindication of their position, which I assume we all take as a, mis as a serious misreading of the poem. In fact, it's the misreading that Jeffers probably anticipated, mm -hmm. which would be why he didn't ever publish it. Um, so it, it, it does create a, a bit of a, of a problem. And I'm wondering if we can come back into the poems from a slightly different angle with the same question in mind. And that is we're talking about the poems largely as argument. What is Jeffers' political argument or what is Jeffers' historical argument? Um, but poems are emotional experiences for the poet and for the reader. If these were simply bits of ideology, we wouldn't still be reading them. So what is it about the poems? And I don't mean in the sense of you know, formal iambic this and you know, dactylic that. Um, what is it about the poems as, as imaginative enterprises uh, that puts us in relationship to this material in a different way? And I wonder if it has something to do in a way, Robert, with what you're touching on, which is that part of what's going on here is the need for Jeffers to come to terms with things experientially and psychologically. And that that's a matter of, as you say, attitude or relationship rather than prescription for what people should be doing. In other words, if we live in a time where there are these conflicts, how does one manage in relationship to it? How does the imaginative action expressed through language provide a similar perspective for the reader? And that may bring us back into some of the, 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 natural, the, the metaphors that are drawn from, from nature and the cycles of nature. Why do those matter in the poem? I'm not trying to settle only on that, but I'm trying to kind of destabilize the question a little bit from was he right or was he left? Was he this politic or was he that politic? He was observant, he was critiquing. How does he relate to the critiquing? And I'll throw one more comment in the mix. You were mentioning the World War II material. Obviously the double acts is a deeply anguished book. The short poems in that collection before he submitted it to Raman House, were at one time gathered as a grouping titled, with a section titled, Mornings in Hell. Mm. They were documentations, they were the documents, they were the diary of his anguished imaginative mornings in hell. That's in a sense on the other side of, of Shine Empire. So that's where Shine Empire is potentially going to end up once the war totally hits. How do you cope with hell? No. In other words, is the issue, what is the right political view, view, or is the issue, is the solace that Jeffers might offer in any of these poems tempting, dangerous, positive? How, how do we relate to these poems as, as well? It's all those things and a great many more. So, well, <laughs> okay. You know, I mean, I I see these poems and many of Jefferson's poems as admonitory meditations, uh, very much in the Stoic tradition of attempts to reestablish and maintain equilibrium, addressed to the self and also to the reader. Um, your earlier the question that was brought forward by one of the in the audience as to whether there have been any support for the attack on the Capitol and Jeffers. And an answer to that would be a categorical no. Uh, even though websites, as you mentioned, Tim, do in fact feature Jeffers's poetry that also talk about uh, the, the attack on the Capitol as having been positive. I can't imagine a, a more thorough misreading. Uh, Jeff, as I said, he's a quietist. His positions are avoidant. It, it, that the political temptation in a time of decay is negative. And what one must do is, is, is maintain balance and equilibrium in hell mm -hmm. and not give way to fantastic conceptions of 
restoring some disappeared social order and some catastrophic uh, misconceived political adventure. They, 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 it's quite different. It's, it, I say, emphasize the Epicurean garden, the, the idea of Epicurus who said quite plainly, you will have nothing to do with the state. You will, you will create a private world within whatever conditions are permissible. And that's where you will find meaning and freedom and purpose, not in the state. So resistance of that kind is unthinkable, at, at least in terms of my own reading of Jefferson for a lifelong reading. His, his admonition is to maintain disengagement, radical disengagement. Not only would he have not attacked the Capitol, he'd be as far away from that as he possibly could be. Uh, and then, uh, Chelsea, you asked earlier, where does he see it? He says, go to the mountains. He, he says that in, 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 in Shine Parish Republic, go to the mountains, just go to the mountains. If they can be got to and there's a space, go to them or build a tower and look out at the Pacific. So it's disengagement and it's, it's a quietistic, it's anything but confrontational and violent, just the absolute, absolute opposite. Well, he counseled that um, there are always the mountains, but I, I don't think Jeffers ever thought for a moment that people could escape their political circumstances in a double sense. They couldn't escape having to, to deal with them and confront them and they couldn't escape them in the sense that they were there, That's, that was, the substance of, of what there was. It's gonna always be easy to misunderstand Jeffers, really. Uh, and the neo-Nazi groups that uh, think tragedy has obligations is um, a brief for Hitler. Well, um, completely completely misunderstand what he was trying to get at in, in, in writing about Hitler as he did, as did no other uh, poet of his time. Um, his fascination with Hitler was a, fa his, a fascination with somebody he thought of as being uh, world historically significant, but in a negative way. He called him a sick child. They also called him a man of genius. And he tried to balance both visions. So I was a, tra a great figure and a tragic figure and a terrible figure, um, not simply as an opponent, but someone to be understood and to be properly placed in his context. And as far as um, what he would make of the present, well, he talked, talks, especially in the 1930s, about an age of Caesars, that the Caesars are coming and, and the democracies are fading. He probably would not have anticipated that our Caesar would be a clown, but, um, you know. Well, he did talk about the little Caesars that itched on their thrones. So I'm not sure he was entirely <laughs> far off. <laughs> As as I look at the poems, I think, um, in, as to get to the to the question, I think um, about his distaste for uh, imbalance of power relationships, and so the thought that he would be in favor of um, the sort of struggle for power that is I see January sixth uh, unfolding in that sense. I, I, I guess I read it uh, like you're saying, Whitney, with the that he would have counseled, let's aim for equilibrium and and not have that sort of um, brazen sort of power struggle that's between two conceptions of what this um, country is or should be. Well, you know, go back to something that, that Tim said in the previous webinar. Tim, you asked at one point whether in the first saying, whether the position of the narrator was an implicated position in the conditions described in the poem or a privileged position perceiving from the outside and above the condition described in the first saying. And I was thinking in the webinar, I didn't say it, that Jefferson's position is both implicated and privileged. And what I'm suggesting is to pick up with what Zoller just said is that certainly you're not gonna be capable of escaping the political circumstances and Jefferson would have understood that. But there is a possibility of achieving a recognition, a sanity, which is a word that Jeffers liked to use, and he used it uh, in the uh, prose introduction to the uh, double acts, that, that you have to be, you're in the, the rock slide, but you can know what its tendencies are, not engage them negatively, and endure them, and endure them with, as he says, let us have some decency at one point in his poems. So, He's not, to, to, I, I think Zoller completely agrees here. He's certainly not a source, if he's read carefully, either poetically or ideologically, for any fantastic political reactionary behavior. There's, there's just nothing in that. 
uh, he, he adopts a position of, of distance and disengagement in the midst. And that's the characteristic for me, that's the characteristic of Jeffersonian position. You're in it, but you can see it, you can understand it and endure it. I'll tell you a little story, if I, if I may, unless there's another question, am I interrupting something? No, go ahead. Um, my wife and I met uh, Don and Jeffers many years ago and uh, had a long dinner. Um, and Don and, um, must have taken me for what I was, a liberal New York intellectual or something who roughly answered to that. And uh, he decided to try to get my goat. And he said at one point after ninth or 10th martini, you know, my father was a fascist. And I said, no, he wasn't. And I'll rest my case on that. I want to maybe cycle back to, to something else. I found it interesting that two of you jumped immediately to the second poem. Um, no one started really uh, with Shine, Parish, and Republic, even though, as you know, to Whitney, it's the one that pretty much everybody knows. And I, I wonder if, there, if there's maybe something to consider here. In Shine, Parish, and Republic, what he offers is the retreat from the economic, the political, the social. Stay away, go to the mountains, however you want to phrase that. If you think about it, one of the dangers of that is that essentially it leads to silence. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to write poems, right? If I'm in the mountains, I can imagine, I, I, can, um, I can contemplate uh, the rock and oh lovely rock. I don't have to write about it after the fact. But if you look at the end of Shine Republic, the last, uh, the next to last line, keep the tradition, conserve the forms, the observances, and then the next phrase, keep the spot sore. Mm -hmm. Be great, carve deep your heel marks, that's your resistance to the mindset of, the, of that era. The states of the next age will no doubt remember you and edge their love of freedom with contempt of luxury. In other words, your critique and resistance of the mindset will provide guidance or inspiration or the possibility in another era. In a sense, this is an anticipation of uh, Gongorism in a thousand years, you write for the future audience. Um, so maybe it's be stoic in the current moment, but record it so powerfully uh, that you become the Aeschylus for a future uh, figure. So there's a kind of a doubleness. There's a, an escapism in the present, which is ironically an engagement in the future. Well, Jeffers has a, a set, series of poems in which he describes the kind of hermit, Tim, that you're talking about, uh, a redeemer right. um, who is making, who's ill and, and not very sane. Uh, mm -hmm. even though his wife um, finds something in him that, uh, that she continues to love. Uh, he says he's making antitoxins for all the happy farms and, and so on. Uh, it's clear that he's an unbalanced figure. It's clear also that he represents Jeffers in many ways, but Jeffers is also at the same time distinguishing himself. And there's an artist uh, where Jeffers comes upon this artist who's working, uh, carving these titanic figures in rock and Jeffers says, leave him alone. And the work will never be seen if the poem has its way and it will never survive. Right. But simply to have made it somewhere means something, but it's not enough because after all, the poet does discover the artist and does describe his work and does keep it in memory. So on the one hand, this, on the, on the other hand, that. On the one hand, retreat. On the other hand, the impossibility of the kind of retreat that, that one is talking about when one thinks of just, I've had enough of this. Um, you know, I'm going to stare at sunsets for the rest of my life. Doesn't work for Jeffers. Okay. I'm reminded of the paradox of Thomas Carlyle, whom Jeffers admired, who wrote uh, 30 volumes, it was said, in praise of silence. So yes, there is this constant reiteration of the 
possibilities of disengagement and silence and, and quietism, but it's constantly reaffirmed. I, I, I'm suggesting again that to some extent, that's the constant revisiting of what it takes to maintain the equilibrium. That Jefferson is, is, is often addressing both himself and his audience in an attempt to reestablish an, a balance and to maintain sanity in hell, in hell by and large, a constantly reachieved uh, balance. So we have a question that says, doesn't Jeffers think, um, I'm sorry, the part of being, can be, one be human, I'm, I'm not paraphrasing, can one be human without there being war? Is, hum, is Can there be humanity without war, I guess is actually the, the question, um, as Jeffers sees it. Well, there can't be humanity without war, but there certainly can be a, hu a condition of human being without war. And, and that's the desirable condition. But the, the war is an inevitability in, 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 in human life. I, I think Jeffers would say that. Mm -hmm. So is the issue for Jeffers war, uh, war or is it pain? In other words, is, can you have, can you be human without pain? Not that I know of. Uh, well, I mean, well said. <laughs> in other words, I'm, I'm wondering whether, whether, whether those things in a sense relate to each other at different scales, because part of the issue for Jeffers uh, is trying to figure out how to cope with the pain of being human, of which war is one escalation of it and of, and then one, um, one response is to move, to step back and to try to uh, contemplate or to admire the beauty um, and, and the such. And, and Shelley, I'm sorry, I, I'm getting in the middle of this more than I intended to, but you were talking about, about the Big Sur area. That's, that's the center of your work. There's two ways of understanding uh, potentially Jeffers in Big Sur. One is it's a retreat into nature, but it's also um, as he imagines it in the 1938 intro to the selective poetry, it's a particular economy and way of life, which is the small ranchy farms, which he then does somewhat advance as a positive alternative to urban civilization. Those two things seem to me to be somewhat, um, from our contemporary perspective, at odds. Um, does that help us at all with these poems? Does that in, bring us in any way into your argument in, in your book? Hmm. Gosh, that's a fascinating question. Um, I'm, I'm struck by um, some comments he made in, in the letters where we see that the days that are most enjoyable for him in Big Sur are the stormy days, the days where he's more connected to the, the natural elements um, there. Uh, he talks about staying at um, an early inn and finding it all too crowded as multiple people were coming to travel past um, and you know the particular part of the river that he was sitting alongside. And I'm thinking what, this must've been a handful of people, right? Mind boggling if we consider what Big Sur looks like today and its popularity and so forth. And so that, I, I think that's a, it's a um, for me, that's emblematic of how he both, like you said, it was a retreat for him, but it was also, um, a place where he wanted to see, I think, what he saw as the best in, um, in humanity, this connection, this understanding of place and being connected to uh, your place by working that land and by not trying to exploit it. Um, and so uh, that the, those, the, the fact that he, he was a, a consumer of it as well though, right? Because he himself did not live there. And, and work the land. And um, so, so I see, I, I like your, your, your point, your observation very much about these two ways of looking at his role as a, as a poet and also as a, um, a, a messenger or a, uh, trying to make uh, some prescriptions perhaps even about, about life or about uh, our posture in this world. Well, I think you can't uh, get away from the fundamental condition that Jeffers saw humanity in by working a farm 
Uh, I just asked Carter about it. Didn't didn't work out for him, and and quite a few other Jeffers protagonists. Um, and the human condition is tragic, and it's tragic partly because of the vision that Jeffers gradually unfolds of a self-torturing God, whose universe is actually the the torture he inflicts on himself. I mean, he has the widest possible conception of the tragic. And he sees human tragedy as an element of that, a, a, a very distinctive part of it. Um, you are not going to draw peace and solace out of Robinson Jeffers. You can draw a lot of things. You can draw strength and courage, but peace and solace go somewhere else. One, one uh, complication Robert, what you just said, what do we do with, with a figure like Tom Birnbaum? The rancher that, the, the rancher that he imagines in the mid thirties is living the perfect life. Yes. Uh, out riding the hills after his cattle. No thought uh, or feeling that his stone age ancestors couldn't have understood. Uh, and that, in other words, part, part of what, what gets complicated here is, is yes, and also yes, and also yes. <laughs> Which is part of why the poetry, I think, ultimately compels us and, and continues to draw us back in. There may be aspects of it that, that trouble us. There may be aspects of it that inspire us. But it, it's, it's always in this um, rich mix of, of variables uh, that continues to compel us. Um, and that's, that's the oddity, I think, about, about these poems. In one sense, they're... They're very systematic, they're very ideological, um, which is partly why they lend themselves to political critique or the kind of political historical critique that we've advanced. And, and yes, I agree, he's, he's Republican with a small R and Jeffersonian and, and so on. And yet they won't quite settle there. They, they won't stay fully stable. Um, they have these tensions and um, I, I guess I'm going to I shouldn't do this, but I'm, I'm going to, to do it anyway. I'm going to give myself the last word. I'm sorry. Um, every, every so often I get carried away. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one of Jeffers' most uh, widely circulated and quoted poems is The Answer, which does seem about as straightforward uh, and a doctrinaire, uh, uh, a set of instructions as, as we could, could hope for. This is the way you should be. Do this, do this, do this, do this. It turns out, if you look at the manuscript for that poem, there was, there was at least one full verse paragraph, and it may have been two, it's been a while since I looked at the material, that he sketched originally and then canceled out. He dropped it out. Cut it, just scored it through and it, it disappears. And in that he starts out by saying, you, meaning himself, you have done this, you have gotten too involved in politics, you've gotten too involved with the current moment, you've lost your way, you've lost your vision, you, you, you've turned into all of these bad things. Let me tell you how to get your act together, Mr. Jeffers. And then we get the answer. So in the original version of the poem, it's a self-indictment. Yes, admonitory meditations. Admonitory meditations. But in the way it comes forward, it is a declaration. Hmm. There is still implicitly that tension within the poem, but the tension is in this particular poem moved somewhat to the background. And it's easy to forget that. And yet those tensions are often what bring us back to these poems and make them resonate and matter to us beyond their ideological um, explicit content. And that's an aspect of Jeffers that I think continues to bring us back to the poetry, continues to drive much of our reading of Jeffers, and yet which we often find it difficult to know how to express um, because it moves us into the mystery of the poem. And that will always, um, well, just move out and get away from our attempts to conceptualize as important and necessary as those are. And as much as his work enables us to do that and invites us to do that. 
Um, so I really appreciate everybody being here tonight uh, and the chance to talk about these poems. There was some good commentary in the chat box, not all of it that we managed to get involved, but there was some back and forth in the chat box uh, that I, I value, that we value as well, that becomes part of the record of the webinar when we post it on the website, which will happen in a few days. And if you missed the previous websites, they are also, or webinars, they are also on the website. So thank you. Uh, we'll be back in about three months. The intention is a program on Robinson Jeffers and photography, uh, which you won't want to miss. Thank you very much for your time and good evening. Thank you. Thank you.